So our next speaker is Mark Catlin. He's a former Occupational Health and Safety Director, retired at this point for the uh, Service Employees International Union, or what we call SEIU, representing 2 million healthcare service and public workers in the United States and Canada. He's an industrial hygienist and health and safety activist since 1991, and he's been involved with asbestos issues his entire career. Uh, Mark has a wonderful career, uh, one of the most knowledgeable people I know on the asbestos issue. And sir, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to start your comments for us and we look forward to it. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for that, for that introduction. It's really good to be here at this year's conference. We really missed not having the conference last year. And uh, I'm also really honored to be able to participate in ADO's prevention advisory board and, and try to support the work of ADAO, this good work. Um, as Tom mentioned, I've, I've worked as an industrial hygienist and I'm still, I'm semi-retired now, still working, but uh, for more than 40 years, I, I've been doing this work. And when I started, asbestos was one of the major issues that I ended up working on. I was working with industrial manufacturing plant workers um, at a union, and, and this was a major issue that we had. Um, and even though I've often moved on to focus on other exposure issues and other hazards with other workers, asbestos always keeps coming back. And, you know, and it's been frustrating to think that we, we thought we got rid of it by the late 80s, early 90s as an issue, and it keeps coming back. And so, and, and just more recently, I've been doing in this last 18 months, mostly work around COVID-19 and protecting workers in schools and, and other, other settings. And what we've been running into more recently is that Congress had appropriated hundreds of billions of dollars to schools to do mitigation for uh, COVID protection of students and staff. And a lot of that is focused on ventilation systems and buildings. And the issue of the legacy asbestos that still remains is, is often unaddressed when this asbestos is being disturbed to protect people from COVID. So we have this legacy problem that keeps showing back up again. So I really appreciate and, and, and so appreciate the work of Linda and all the, uh, all the ADO volunteers and supporters because this work is so important and I'd love to see this go away as a major issue before I end my time on the planet. I thought it would be done by the time I retired. That hasn't happened. Um, and as Tom mentioned, I, I've, I've worked most of my career uh, working as a health and safety professional with uh, labor unions and their members and, and dealing with a variety of hazards, including asbestos. And the, you know, the tragedies that, that Rebecca mentioned and that Kelly mentioned with AFT, you know, I could repeat those same stories during my time with SEIU. We have lots of members in schools. We have members who clean buildings and maintain buildings. And so there's lots of potential for exposure. Many of our members are told by their employers, if they ask, that asbestos has been banned as if that takes care of their problem. Or they'll be told, oh, it's a, it was all removed from the buildings many years ago. There's no problem. And our members are often very angry, very upset when they find out that this, uh, that this was not true. And so this, you know, the work of ADAO is so important, both on the ban, uh, which is critical to finish that work, but also on the education to try to prevent these exposures to the legacy asbestos. SEIU was a leader in, was one of the leaders in, in trying to control asbestos back in the 1980s, with AFT and lots of other unions were part of that. Um, you know, and we won those key victories that, that Kelly mentioned, but we didn't win them all. And you know, the, the ban was the major one that we lost on. And after that, we, we in, to a great extent, many of us in safety and health moved on to other issues because they came up and we kind of hoped that the asbestos issue would be, uh, would be dealt with by the existing laws and regulations. Well, unfortunately, many of the agencies, EPA, OSHA, state agencies that had authority over asbestos also seemed to move on. And I recall by the late 90s, hearing from, uh, hearing from many of these regulatory agencies that, oh, there's training requirements and certification, and we don't have to worry about asbestos anymore. But a lot of us, you know, saw that this was really not true, and that things seemed to be getting worse. And uh, and so that's where we are today. Um, the I wanted to give a give a, a short since we've been telling wonderful stories here. Of a, I want to remember my friend Dan Middall. Dan was a construction insulator who started in the 1970s. 
He was a member of the Asbestos Workers Union Local 97 in Anchorage, Alaska. And that's where I met Dan and worked with Dan. He was an early act activist for the control of asbestos exposure because of his early exposures and he had, asbest he had early stages of asbestosis as a fairly young man. In the 1970s, uh, when Dan moved to Alaska to work because of the Alaska pipeline and other reasons, uh, uh, there was a lot of asbestos being installed in, uh, throughout facilities in Alaska. Alaska, it turns out, was a dumping ground for many of the major manufacturers because they couldn't sell products to more knowledgeable uh, 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 organizations in the lower 48 who were starting to see the coming ban on, us, on some asbestos products, but they were sold in Alaska. And so he used to joke that he spent the first half of his insulator career uh, installing asbestos products and that he would spend the second half of his insulator career removing them. Uh, but he was he was an early uh, he was an early worker in terms of developing and 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 learning about asbestos abatement techniques and respiratory protection and other and other parts of that trade. He was an early teacher in his union and in, in the state of Alaska on both the dangers of asbestos and how to do abatement properly to to both apprentice, apprentices and and journeyman insulators. And I learned a lot about this work from him in my in my early days as a young hygienist. Uh, unfortunately, Dan died from asbestos-related uh, diseases uh, a, a little more than a decade ago, just before I attended my first conference uh, with ADAO. And so I, I, I connect Dan's legacy and Dan's life with, with ongoing with ADAO's work. And so thank you so much again. Um, during the 1990s, a lot of my work around asbestos focused on training and education of both union and non-union construction workers uh, and many trades who are required by the laws and regulations we had won in the 1980s uh, to be trained and certified to remove this, especially abatement workers. And you know, we were hoping that this would be the action that would really help out. Um, so in the course of doing a lot of that and, and doing a lot of that training and, and also starting to run into abatement workers who are now attending their 10th or 12th asbestos training refresher course, I, I started looking for ways to liven up and, and highlight some of the issues that seem to be dying out. And so um, what I discovered then was, was uh, increasingly available uh, historical films about from asbestos producers. Johns Mansfield made films highlighting their products in the 20s and in the 40s and in the 60s. Other manufacturers also put out promo films about this. And then in the 60s and 70s, there started to be films from, from unions and government and organizations trying to highlight the hazards of asbestos that, were, that had been uncovered and how to deal with that asbestos. So there's this actually extensive history of, of, of film and video that talk about the work that, that ADAO is now leading. And so um, I used those in training and they were very, uh, they were very useful. In 2006, when YouTube showed up, I started a, um, a channel of historical films. And I would, and this is the URL, hopefully you can see that. And um, I want to encourage people to take a look at this site and to look at the asbestos films and use these because I think they become very helpful so that we don't forget that these manufacturers knew of these hazards, that they expanded the use of these products in, a, in an amazing way over many decades. And that we as, and that the government has also known about these dangers for a long time and has been slow to finally deal with it. So we wanna keep this history alive and not let it forget. I've also found that these films are very useful in, uh, uh, they're, they're useful in campaigns against uh, asbestos exposures. And so they can be useful And ADAO has used some of these historical films. Uh, they've been also useful in some litigation where attorneys have wanted to use the films to to show what exposures used to be like, because when you're trying to describe a worker exposure 40 years ago, you might need to show the judge and the jury this sort of, these sort of examples. And so that was an unexpected use of the films, but mostly the films have been used to educate physicians and public health students and workers and others about the hazards of asbestos. And so I would urge people to take a look at the site, take a look at the films and, and to sort of see how these can be useful in the work of a both in the work on asbestos control and to further the aims of ADAO. Um, there's some new films that are coming up that are, that are, that are recently uncovered that, um, that, uh, 
the focus on Dr. Irving Solikoff from Mount Sinai and his early work in the 60s and 70s. And, and it's some amazing footage of him talking about the dangers of asbestos all the way back then. So take a look at the channel, uh, keep up the great work of ADAO, uh, support the, the Alan Rangstein ban on asbestos and write the letters from the AFL-CIO campaign and we'll help move this work forward. Thank you so much, Linda and everybody else. I'm happy to be here and I'll throw it back to Tom. Thank you, Mark. If you guys haven't found his pages, he's got a Facebook page too, uh, that you can get some of these videos. Um, as a someone that was in the training room for 35 years, uh, I found a lot of these things too, but I started using his webpage and sending it to all kinds of people around the world that needed those uh, pieces of information. Some of the historical films he has are just wonderful. So thank you very much, Mark, for all of that.